Oh, I, I actually think we might be live. Are we actually, are we actually live? Oh, it says we are. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. I was lost for just a moment, but now I'm back. Oh God, we are live indeed. We are. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to like actually go to my channel and look and make sure like everyone can see. Um, oh, it's just, it just yes. launched an ad at me. How dare it? How dare it? I need to make a dramatic reveal after all. Oh, we are live. We are live. Oh, oh my I didn't goodness. see you there, people. <laughs> this is actually working. This is so funny because when I say that we did, we were down to the last minute to get the tech ready. It's actually true. Yes, but just like every single hero in every single bad action flick movie, we came in at the last possible moment. <laughs> we did. Dad was like watching me sweat while mumbling to myself about tech words. And it was just like, you like you could cut the tension with a knife. I was like, we have to go live in 30 seconds. And then I was like, I found where the stream key thing is. Um, no, not Victorian, no, not Victorian actually. actually. Bad, bad, bad movie, movie, movie with, with, with something, something, something. I don't know, but, I don't know, but, but I'm, I'm sitting, sitting here with my teachers watching, watching this and having the time of my life and I've been terrible, 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 terrible. Anyway, anyway. I'm somehow getting an insane echo, so let me just make sure that this is not me. Um, Hold on. Mute, unmute. Yes, yes, hello, hello, hello. Hmm, it's still echoing for me. Let me ask this, let me ask the chat. Chat, do you hear tap echoing or is that just me? Um, oh, massive echo, okay. Massive, okay, massive okay, echo, okay, and I'll have, okay, to, I'll have to fix something, fix something. Yeah, hold up. Let is it better now? Better now. I, 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 I made the, I game, made the game less, less, less somehow, somehow on, this thing, on, this thing. on this thing. I wonder where it's coming from. I wonder if it's... I wonder if it's tap or with my bad, my bad, might just might just be me. It might it might just be me. I don't know. I don't know the first technology. technology. Uh, everyone's like it sounds like it's um just for effect, really. But let me see here. So I'm. I wonder if I can edit the audio. Okay. What if? Test speaker. Okay. Just tap. Okay. So it's just tap. So tap. I wonder, do you have um your Zoom settings? If you click on your like um little mute button down at the bottom left and the arrow, is your microphone set to your Yeti? And then it is. It is. Sets to my Yeti. 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 And then your speaker. You know what? It might be hearing your voice on your, is your speaker set to one that you can hear in your room? That's like, it's like. Honestly, honestly it might very well, well, well be. So that so means, that I'll, means I'll, I'll switch over to my. my. I wonder if we put you on a headphone. I don't have switch a headphone. Your I have, okay. I have nothing. Now I just have a normal microphone in the computer itself. I don't know if it's better or worse. It's all better. That oh, fixed perfect. It. It's all better. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, Introductions are a thing, uh, a thing that we need to do now. I don't know if anyone <laughs> knows us out there and they went internet. We need to introduce ourselves indeed. Let me ask the chat as long as that fixed it. It fixed the echo on my end, so I'm, I'm pretty confident that that fixed it on everyone else's Fucking better be. That have, oh, it's fixed. Yes, it's fixed. Okay. Excellent. See? Technology. There's that, you sometimes don't know until you're live what's going to break. So, um, Okay. So I am so excited that we can now set the technology problems aside and let's have Taff. That's not your real name, but that's what I call you because that was your screen name when we first met. That's true. And But however you wish to introduce yourself, why don't you tell everyone watching who you are, oh. what you've done and what you're working on? Oh, that was a bad idea on your part, but I... Do it nonetheless. Good day, internet people. My name is the Disastrous Golf, aka Lauren, aka Lord Tuffermet, aka whatever the hell you want to call me. I am mostly a nerd. I'm a college student, but I'm also the creator of Soul Blight, the very first third party setting for this magnificent being's Shadow Dark RPG coming soon, hopefully in March with a Kickstarter. I have no 
idea about od and I shall point that out in first hand. My interest in the capital of Russia is basically solely academic, which is ironic because that's exactly what I am, an academic, and I will, it will haunt me until my dying day. But that is me. That is, that is the guest that you settled for, Kelsey, instead of with an actual properly intelligent and proficient dungeon master who played this thing before. It's just me. There you no, go. you're going to carry this because I am in no, in, in no way any more qualified to be talking about this. This, this whole thing started because Tath and I were joking on Twitter about how we love dissecting this particular adventure and how like we weren't sure if anybody else would appreciate it, but we could appreciate it and like talk about it to each other. And so then we were like, well, maybe we should just live stream this discussion about us loving this adventure. And are you, are you, are you telling me that you were joking about this on Twitter and not telling the truth? You were not serious. No, I was telling the was? truth. I was oh, entirely serious. I was entirely serious. This entire serious. thing is based on a lie. <laughs> I've never read it. No, it's no, I was trying to be lighthearted about the fact that I feel like when I talk about I think it's pronounced Thracia, but I incorrectly call it Thracia all the time. Thracia, when I talk about it, I feel like a French sommelier, like discussing the soil quality of, you know, the Bordeaux region in 1812. Like, I feel like it's so, <laughs> it's so deeply academic sometimes that no one appreciates it. But then Tath was like, I appreciate it. And then I was like, that's why we're friends. So, um, you heard it all. We're friends now. You heard it all, everyone on the internet. It's official. It's official. It's official. And my name, by the way, is Kelsey Dion. I um, run the Arcane Library. I maybe should have said that. This is my YouTube channel. So if you don't know that, then welcome. And th this is us. We're going to talk about Caverns of Thrass here today. So um, why don't we? I have some notes. They're totally bad. Um, and I know. So, Tat, we had, we had been kind of in our preliminary geeking out about this we had been talking about some like overarching reasons why we really like this adventure um it is by Janelle Jacquay Jacquay's I think she pronounces her last name Jacquees I am Jacques. gonna I'm gonna have to look that up in hindsight um but this adventure was written in 1979 um and so it's 43 years old it at today as of today and it's it's still it's still an example of some of the best 3d dungeon design and like like creating a natural environment with real feeling history ever it's like it's one of the first adventures that was ever written and published modules ever and it's still one of the best in this regard so this is what's so fascinating about it Yes, and it still holds up to this very day because, I mean, during a time where Greyhawk and, you know, the medieval, European medieval historical setting was basically the standard, Caverns of Thracia broke a mold early on, very early on, by introducing an ancient Greece Minoan-inspired setting that to this day, I think, is rarely done. I think um, the most recent one that really hit, like, the... Uh, the big number, so to speak, was the um, the Odyssey thing that Wizards of the Coast brought out, I think, like a year ago or so. I'm not quite certain on the title of it. If someone in the chat could remind me of it, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Is it so the, the overall Wizards, what was it called? My Mythic Odyssey of Theros was the fifth edition. Like, they were trying to do, like, the they were aiming for Greek Minoan, like, vibes, yes. right? Yeah. And that, so they, that was like the first official, that was actually one of, I don't know if that's, ever, if it's been done much since Caverns of Thracia, it, uh, apart from that, like, I don't think there's, there's been an official or really no, landmark. Official, thing. most likely not, but I'm certain yeah. that there are lots of like third party and homebrew settings that take a lot of inspiration from Minoan mm -hmm. and ancient Greece, but technically what should be also called like, hmm. Yeah, no, Minoan and Greece is actually accurate. I was wondering if we should call it like Cretian, Cretian in general, but yeah, like, no, Minoan. That's yeah, okay. I think I always, because I, I, because of Thracia, I wrote an adventure that was also inspired by the, the castle. Well, it's like a complex called Knossos on the island of Crete. And I, I would mm. never have really been diving into that history without having read this adventure and becoming fascinated by where some of its architectural inspiration must have come from. So yeah, so like, I wrote an entire adventure because 
I was inspired by this one about the culture it's based on. So <laughs> yeah, but our, our topics, and I should probably actually give an outline of sort of what we're hoping to hit on today. So what, one of the first points that we had been geeking out about was that this adventure is, is really known and emulated um, due to its super open, like 3D exploration um, style design. And, and I think like nowadays in D&D design, that does appear often, right? Like you have a level and then there's a level below it that's connected thematically and they can, you know, there's interplay between the two. But at the time of writing this adventure, that had never been done. It, it literally had never been done. Every adventure was kind of a funhouse style monster museum that didn't really attempt to build a lot of continuity between the levels or sections of the dungeon. Yeah. So you could have like a magical forest in one part of a dungeon, then uh, I don't know, like a volcanic death in the next one. There was like very little connection between those two. Yeah. Like White Plume Mountain is, I think, like one of the most famous funhouse dungeons when it comes to that. Yes, which is an, I mean, it's really cool. There's so much cool stuff going on in that one, but it does feel like um, you're moving from like crazy location to the next without always a ton of connection thematically between them. And this adventure just, it just, it, it, it almost feels like an Indiana Jones movie because you go in and there's this growing communication of the history and the the people and the culture of the building and who used it and like who's currently using it and it all fits together which is between all the levels which is wild like you can build a story about what happened in the history of this location just due to what you see and put together over time and yet it is still possible to do this entire adventure with, while committing almost far less destruction of ancient artifacts like in, than in Indiana, Indiana Jones Yes, <laughs> there's no, this belongs in a museum type, you know. Which is not a thing that archaeologists should do nowadays. And just pointing that out here for the audience. It's, which right, right. Should you sh everyone should know, everyone should know that don't take the, the important archaeological artifacts out of their sight. Leave it there. Leave it there. Leave it but. there. You know, that D&D players, however, totally different story for them. It's all about, <laughs> it's all about. We, 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 we just want our gold. We just want our gold. We, just we don't care lose. where it comes from. We're murder hobos, all of us, deep down in between. But we, we maybe we should get back to us, the schedule that we actually had because we didn't get touched that yet. Yes, the whole thing, the whole point, all of the points in general. So um, yes. we have been talking about the 3D environment. Another point we wanted to cover was sort of, um, I guess, like the naturalistic style of the environment. That might be a subcategory. Um and then tap we I think that we should talk about the faction gameplay yeah. a little bit. I know that that's an important one for this. It is. Um number 4, I think I added one since we last spoke so forgive me, but number 4 was um this by the way. I know. Hey, we're going to wing it. We're improv masters here. Right. Oh. <laughs> um Done. flavorful setting, a flavorful setting that doesn't fall into like typical fantasy tropes like you said. It's inspired more by Greek history, which is something you didn't see that often. Um, and then th the last one, which might be our favorite, is the fact that there are a ton of themed sections and secret like sub levels to this dungeon that are just amazing. But the, the, the way they're presented, the reason for their existence and the way to find them is all just like, it's my favorite part of this dungeon. Yes. So I am excited. Yeah, I am too. I, I wonder, so, so, okay, so point one was the 3D environment, extremely open exploration. And I think that it would be fun to talk about some like concrete examples of that from this adventure, because it's still to this day holds up as one of the best examples of this. Um, and I don't know how you feel, Tath, but I feel like when the level one, when you first come into this dungeon, it's kind of got a big open first level that has a temple sort of theme to it, but it's mm. cut by huge ravines. There yes. are these huge ravines cut across the dungeon that speak to some kind of calamity. Um, and it's those ravines that really set this up. Um, the ways to get into the dungeon and the ravines. So um, there are three ways, right? There are three ways to enter. Three ways level. in total. <laughs> Number one is the main entrance, which everyone gets to see and can everyone just use. My favorite aspect about it is that it's full of bat guano. 
Yes. Which is just a thing. <laughs> the first room, the first room that you step into in this adventure, is just caked in bad guano, and you can just slip and slide in there. And the next room, right after afterwards, room, room number two is full of bats that hang there. Which honestly, you know what? It's just one of my favorite things. The dungeon is a living space. Of course, the animals would shit everywhere. Yes. Wonderful. And it's so, again, so landmark because that that wasn't really, I don't think that was taken much into consideration in early adventure design that this is a real place with wild animals. I know, and it sounds yes. crazy because adventures were so focused on the monsters that that maybe they didn't leave enough room to be like, yeah, there's bat poop you can slip on. There are centipedes you can eat. There are... Um, creatures that are not just standing there waiting to fight, they're like hunting or patrolling. They're doing natural things in the environment that they exist in. Yeah. And it's so simple in hindsight, but it's just like making the bat guano a problem makes the place feel so real. It's like there's mud on your boots when you come in. There's mud on your boots and it also tells the people here that this place has not been visited by humans or like more humanoid people in a long time, except for explorers. No one has cleaned this place up. No one has tried to like um, carve a pathway through this. This bat guano has been caking this sacred place for centuries. And that's how you know there's some evil shit down there and also potentially lots of gold. Yep. Speaking of evil shit, I would like to, uh, even though we're already at the first level, I would like to point out another part about the entrance part. Now, my dear esteemed friends, gentlemen, lasses, and ladders, there's a hole, just a hole, on the very first part when you get into the, before you even get into the dungeon, there's a hole, five feet wide, just a bloody hole. It's round, it might potentially be one of the entrances that you're looking for. If you do not use a bloody rope, or like any sort of climbing expertise, you will drop literally about a hundred feet into one of the ravines that Kelsey just mentioned at the beginning of, of this discussion. And potentially you can even drop into the second level down below. Through the caverns, but, the ravines, yes. Verticality is a thing in this dungeon. It's at least very much in the first two levels. In the mm -hmm. third and fourth, it's a bit more, a bit different because you know, mm -hmm. um, the fourth one is literally just the dungeons of the dungeon and the third, third one is just the, the palace, but the first two levels spe specifically, lots of verticality. Yeah. And another fun thing about this starting area, there is a part, if you go to the west end of a certain building, you just get hit by 12 darts of lizard men who have been skulking around in the forest nearby, who are just seeing you from the bushes and say, God damn it, not another bunch of adventurers once again, just get out of our, get out! Get yes, up. they're waiting. They're waiting because they're patrolling. And that's yes. a huge, important part of the living nature of this place. There are factions inside this entire complex, top to bottom. There are four levels technically to this dungeon. And all throughout, it's about factions. So there are the lizard men. Yes, there, there are three factions. And this, this one is the lizard men slash beast men alliance. So... There's a mixture of lizard folk who were like the really ancient inhabitants of this building before their like society fell. Um, and then beast folk who were later inhabitants and they have an uneasy alliance right now because they're mad at the human cultists who are taking over the first level, worshiping the death god Thanatos. And who themselves are descendants of the ancient Thracian society who previously used the beastmen as, well, because they were ancient Greeks and ancient Romans and whatever, of course, as slaves. Because yes. that's just what you do in these ancient societies. Yep, yes. until the beastmen revolted and triumphed and kicked them out. And they then became the barbarians fleeing into the swamp for hundreds of years and kind of having a crumbling culture and society. So, Well, meanwhile, the beastmen crowned the first Minosaur king. Yes, yes. And so that's the current state of things. And this this touches on the notion of faction play, um, which is, again, such a beautiful design element of this adventure, because the, it's the perfect setup of factions. You have roughly three factions, right? Um, yeah. The lizard folk is sort of a sub faction that can be influenced either away or uh, toward their beast man al allies. But the, the setup here is that everything is kind of at a 
um, like a standstill, right? Or like a roadblock where no particular faction can quite gain an advantage on the other. Um, mm. And it is the characters who could influence the outcome of that. Their introduction into this dungeon is what can swing the balance in favor of one faction or the other. So not only can the characters do that, but they almost have to, to survive this dungeon. They almost, ha they have to engage with a faction in some way, or they're going to get overrun. So yes, because the dungeon is exceedingly brutal. At the very beginning already, we have like this massive list of random encounter tables and almost every single room, as far as I could tell from my read through of like multiple times of this dungeon specifically, it features like a dozen monsters per room at minimum almost. Like this oh, is like yeah. the average, I think. Mm -hmm. It could be anything from lizard folk to human cultists to tribesmen to the undead. And of course, those wonderful random walking statues, the sinks, the minotaurs, and death itself stalking the halls. Yes. Yeah, there's so much. Um, there, there are like subsections of the dungeon that are themed, but then, you know, Janelle like had peppered these mythological creatures throughout the dungeon too, like the Sphinx. And there are these incredible animated statues that, that, can really harry the characters and they're so scary because they're so difficult to defeat. Um, and it's kind of all about avoiding them, learning how to deal with them, not treating it as a combat, but as more of a puzzle. Like how do we work with the Sphinx? How do we escape the statues, you know? So, um, and then just their existence lends a great deal of history and gravity to the whole place. Cause you're like, you're, there's a Sphinx in here, you know, this ancient being of wisdom. It's just awesome. Yeah. About the only beings that you can't really interact with socially are really just the undead, because that's just a given. No one's going to talk of an undead. Well, apart from one specific undead, we'll, but we'll get to him later. <laughs> and I think, well, yeah, the, the avatars of Thanatos that do haunt a very specific area, which we're once again getting back to the themed areas of this dungeon. There are two instances of a aspect, or at least a representation of a death god, that this cult that, by the way, was not like you know, the main culture for us, but just like a splinter faction that gained power afterwards, just walks about this place. You have the, uh, the incarnation of death, and on the third level, I believe it was, or, or one of the third levels, because there are like yeah. multiple subsections of the third level, you have a bronze statue of Thanatos. And they're brutal. <laughs> this is not a dungeon that you can just... Um, with a 5e mindset, you couldn't brave this dungeon. You would have to make use of all the adventuring gear, um, perhaps with like a lot of social interactions, also just, you know, fight or flight. You have to cut your losses sometimes because um, I'm not all too familiar with od and I think you're more experienced with that than I am. But from my understanding is any anywhere between like first to second level characters are basically just one swing of their dead. Yes. Usually. Yes. And most of these monsters here also do deal out quite a lot of damage just with a singular attack. And numbers, especially overwhelming numbers, are always a thing in this place because the lizard folk and the beastmen make use of the ancient technology and the magic that is found in this dungeon. That's another thing that's really fascinating with this particular very old dungeon. The monsters use the technology and the items in the dungeon against the adventurers. They use the teleportation pads on the second and third levels. They use the basins of elemental water. And they even make use of various traps and of the stone statues around here. But you can use those things against them as well. So yes. that's a wonderful thing. The dungeon allows you to interact with it in various different levels, various different methods. Yeah, and the, the point too, one of the most fun points of that, the monsters are aware of secret doors, traps, things that they've set up, like they, they're aware of where their own factions are, and even where some subsections of the dungeon are that the other factions don't know about. And so the point of the, in, the interplay between the factions is you the characters can and should try to get that information from the monsters and the NPCs like the, it's it's almost necessary for them to really learn their way around the dungeon is to get some of that from prisoners or alliances or by following monsters around and stalking them and seeing where they go 
because I think there are, I, I remember checking into this. I believe there are 59 secret doors in this dungeon. 59. I think around I mean, that number. Yeah. A lot. That's a lot, but they're not just the kind that you go up to a wall and tap on the wall and find like the monsters are using them or Mm -hmm. they're visible from one area from one side and they're not from the other and so you you have to engage with the denizens in order to really see where all of these secrets lie yeah and the design behind it um janelle jack jack janelle jack jackie jack Jacques, Jackie. I apologize. I apologize. Your name sounds so French, and I uphold the French. I'm sorry, but I will try my <laughs> best. Um, Janelle Jackie, I'll just call her Jackie because that's how she prefers it, um, made a part of a dungeon uh, design as well that you don't, don't just, you know, in those times just roll roll to find something. No, she she put out like the, the varying different... Pfft, the, the various different uh, secret doors, they are outlined, they are described, they are detailed for the dungeon master so that the players can note them without doing like a standard role, which, well, you know, for those times, I think was like a very much a, I dare say, almost 5e d d thing to do because I don't think that back then a lot of these things were just built into the dungeon like that. Of course, I could be, I could be wrong. I'm not a grok nut. I am I am very young by relations to these people, so it's you know it's it, I don't know if Grognard says is um, if it's earned or if you're born with it. I don't know, but um, I don't know, but but yes, it's true that the, the secret doors here are. It's just so interesting because I feel like I feel like we we as the additions have gone on, we've reduced secret doors down to like make a perception check, you find it yes or no, and there's different ways you could approach the secret doors in this dungeon. Like in in some cases you could make a roll to see if your character notices it. That was a part of the original rule set, but there's also this assumption that the characters are going to actively look for them in suspicious places. And so, yeah, like the, the chance to auto find them or the chance to just witness one being used, you know, there's, there's so many ways that the secret doors are meant to be interacted with in this dungeon that it's kind of like, it's refreshing because it's not just roll check find it always it's it's so much more layered you know and i think mm-hmm. that we forget sometimes in design that that you know gating the different sections of the dungeon through secret doors and stuff like that it it, it doesn't have to just be a a one trick pony about how to find those doors yeah yes. And mm-hmm. speaking of like you know classical D- ODD things i noticed there's only a singular um gelatinous cube in this entire dungeon as far as i can tell a single one and usually you'd find them in droves there's yes. only one and isn't it a random encounter too so you're not I think necessarily it is a random encounter. it's like noted at the beginning before we even get to the dungeon levels themselves one of these random encounters is just a gelatinous cube and it's the only gelatinous cube in the entire dungeon as far as i can tell if i remember correctly and that's just restraint that's just funny to me because <laughs> yes. we're getting back to that thing about um this dungeon using primarily creatures from like minoan and greek myth because i have a pop quiz for you kelsey here right Ooh. now okay kelsey you would agree with me i believe that a minotaur and a lizard folk are both chimeric beings of humanoid and bestial nature correct yes yes okay what the hell is a lizard minotaur then I know, there's a lizard there's a minotaur lizard. in this fucking dungeon and to yes. this day i can't wrap my hat around how this is supposed to look? Is it a minotaur that has like scales? Is it a lizard folk with like an ox head? Is it a is it like a minotaur that has the body of a human but the head of a ox and the lower body of a lizard? What is this creature? How did I it know. get here? We're what left is, to imagine. Is it minotaur? <laughs> Where did it even come from? Because like the lizard faction is like really predates the minotaurs. Like the they came a lot later into the history of this dungeon, and so I'm like. Where did the crossover between these two species even occur? Like it's, it's and even more importantly, was this a natural thing, or was was this a um, laboratory thing? Because I don't want to think about the implications of this being a natural occurring process of somehow a lizard folk and a minotaur deciding to do the do together. Because it was just it's unthinkable. I can't even imagine it. And what and then what does this creature even look like? I don't, yes. I, I still don't know. Yeah, I, the no first time I read it, yeah, I, 
I actually read it as an actual more lizard kind kind of being with a minotaur head, which is probably not at all how it was intended. But like, I was like, what is this? Like a four leg giant gecko with a minotaur head? I I don't know. Um, Honestly, I imagine it to be like this terrible um, centaur being like lower body of a gecko, upper body of a human minotaur head. Yeah. And this was so confusing. But unless it is like lower body of a human, upper body of an ox, and then just a lizard head. And then just a lizard head. I, it's entirely, I like that it's open to interpretation. This is another big thing of these kinds of adventures is that there wasn't a lot of over explaining of the way things looked. It was, it, there was an attempt to let the game master kind of interpret in some ways. Um, and I, I like, I think that's refreshing because yeah. the, the, the lizard minotaur for you might be totally different than for me. And so it's kind of fun to get to decide on your own version of it. You can have a little lizard minotaur centipede as a treat. <laughs> you just can. <laughs> We're just blending all of the different disparate factions, which speaking of, okay, we have been excited to talk about, I feel like it's time to talk about the lizard king. Oh, you mean the fucking lizard king, the immortal lizard king, the, the giant immortal- mummy with the giant wings. Yes, let's yes. talk about the lizard king. <laughs> I love it. It's it's like Kath and I were both agreeing that this has to be probably one of our favorite parts. And and e- even before we talk the specifics of the the creature, the fact that where it exists and how it is found is one of my favorite parts of this dungeon. So because you have to go out of your way to find it, really. You have yes. to go out of your way. But every single step of the way, you are shown what this creature is in the history of the lizard folk people by the mosaic, mosaic, mosaics, by the wall paintings and the carvings. And every step of the way, you get to realize, oh, oh, this is, this is the big cheese of the lizard folk. This is the king. This is the immortal king who ate humans and beasts and dinosaurs alike. And he could be sitting on a lot of treasure. But he could also be very powerful, and he is very powerful. He is absurdly powerful. I do not know how od and works, as said, but reading the stat block in comparison to all the others, this motherfucker has a lot of spells. A oh, yeah, spells. you won't win if you, because this adventure is, is for, it's an, it, you know, for low-level adventurers at first, and there's a lich in the dungeon, and the, the most- Lizard lich. A lizard lich, and like- the first king of the first people that lived in this dungeon. And he, he, um, what's even more incredible, I, I always marvel at this. Like when we go back to like the design side, this is one of the coolest subsections. It's technically a subsection of the dungeon. Yeah. Groups can go the entire, the entire dungeon without ever encountering it. So it is a prize unto itself because if the players discover it, it's this wealth of background information about the complex that really kind of adds this this immense amount of wonder to the space because you're seeing, like you said, all the mosaics, murals, hints at this being, but you may never actually find it. And if you do, it's somehow incredibly gratifying to know that you you discovered the secret. Um, And can you, I mean, can you imagine writing something so cool and having it be entirely hidden and optional? Like the amount of design restraint that takes to be like, players may never, ever, ever find this. I know this from my own campaigns that I run, from all the stories that I write, but yes. So, um, and also one of the things that I'm really always excited about, whenever I get to this section, the introduction of the Lizard King is um, just something that I'm, something that I'm always in awe at because you get through this narrow tunnel first with like the cavern paintings of the Lizard King literally burning down forests, eating dinosaurs and human sacrifices. So, you know, Okay, so there's this approaching feeling of doom, and then you get to this the, the sepulchre itself, and he just sits there. He sits there on this pile of treasure, is a massive, towering lizard folk mummified corpse, and then just spreads these bat like wings, turns his eyes on you, red glowing, and then he just teleports away, he just leaves. And you are, and, and because he teleports behind you technically, in the room behind you, in the room further behind you, summons over elementals, and then you get like this, um, I'd say this Lord of the Rings Balrog moment almost, mm-hmm. where you just hear, 
the drums in the distance. And you know shit is going, about to go down because if you don't talk with this guy, if you don't like a- approach him and say like, hey, sorry about disturbing your nab. Um, can we do something, I don't know, help you out with some minor toss or cultists or anything? Please just don't kill us. He will kill you. <laughs> he will he- kill you. He will, he will. And and if, and if he kills you, I almost have to say you deserved it because you should know when you see something like that, that it's, I mean, any group that attacks him, I think they should have known better, right? Because the, the power, his, the power that this being exudes is overwhelming and he's, he is a terror to behold. You so beautifully described the scene of coming upon him. He's an undead Gods to the lizard folk after all. They de- dedicated this entire section of the temple entirely to him. If you don't be care- if you're not careful, really, just like just from entering that and seeing a cavern painting of like a giant wing spreaded lizard folk shooting death beams out of his eyes, I don't think you deserve to live, honestly. I know. <laughs> you don't, you don't. But it's you also don't. like it's not written to be a mean death trap. It's not written to be that way. It's written to be this incredible opportunity for the players because if they actually discover this area, first of all, kudos, it is not easy to find. And they're like going through a room with like doors that open up into the astral plane. So they should already be like, what sorcery is this? Like, this is a place that just exudes magic and ancientness. And they get the chance to, essentially, I guess, parlay with this, this incredible being because it wants something. It wants, it wants to bring back about the rise of the lizard people in this complex. And so it's not just there to kill you. You can yes. actually negotiate with it. You just have to be very tactical when dealing with it because, I mean, this being is like millennial. Like, I think, I think it was called like a thousand-year-old king or something. Yeah. And that's been worshipped by the list for a long, long time. So it's not going to just um, take any sass, so to speak, from anyone, especially not the bards. People should the fear for their life when they meet this yes. guy, because he can. He can just, I think he his spell list is outrageous. And then, of course, you die at zero HP in original D&D. So if you take a delayed blast fireball to the face because he gets mad at you, I mean, that's kind yeah. of it. So I mean, he could just, um, like, start up negotiations, just cast the delayed blast fireball behind you to say, all right, I'll hear your proposal. If, it, if I don't like it, I'll just detonate this thing behind you. Yes! You have, you have, you have my attention, but not my patience. Exactly. Oh, that'd be such a great way, Tat. That is such a great way to present him. I love that. I, I think, like, and it's, it's again, it's, it's again down to... So in old school D&D, the point wasn't combat always. Yeah. Like, there were reaction roles to see how, um, you know, enemies who didn't necessarily have an opinion of you felt about you. And very often those reaction roles actually led to the enemies being willing to talk to you. It wasn't just like hostile. Yeah, There's a especially, lot more options than hostile. Especially because you encourage like from the very beginning to interact with these creatures socially in a sense. The lizard folk are described as, you know, the degenerate offspring, but they still have a culture. They have a language of their own. The tra- Thracian tribesmen have a language of their own. Even the beast folk also have languages of their own. They do do stuff around the dungeon that is not always like related to ah oh, we're just gonna kill every adventurer that comes in or like kill anyone that comes across our way no they have they are set up often just like you can see like gnolls just sitting around just talking with each other just sharing campfire stories you kind of come come across um um the minotaur king in his own private chambers but of course if he gets to the minotaur king in his private chambers at this point i think you are an intruder where he just prepares like you know a nice, a nice roasted adventurer beef for uh, yeah. For there's like family. a human on a spit being roasted down there, and like, you know, and his be, family. That be, yeah, that might be creepy for you know the, the average mortal adventurer, but you know what? To the mind of king, this is just this is just nice Thanksgiving dinner with the family. There it's you just, go. They like they need something to eat, and <laughs> and it just it's one thing too that that in the study of this adventure, because this adventure is well worth studying from a design perspective, yeah. it, it's, it's, I think that it is so often forgotten in modern D and D that factions and engaging with the NPCs and the monsters is crucial or it should be, you know, it's, it's a part of adventure design that I feel has kind of slipped away sometimes. And 
this adventure, I mean, if you read it cover to cover and you imagine characters finding themselves encountering these beings, you, you acknowledge that you have to use the factions to get through this dungeon. You just have to. Yes, I would say that um, well, there's still an aspect of like interacting with NPCs or like monsters in the dungeon and even modern D&D. Most of the time, it is like explicitly laid out of the DM to, that these certain specific NPC creatures are to be interacted with and the rest are just mostly cannon fodder. Mm -hmm. um, here we have like, I think four named NPCs, really, throughout the entire thing. We have Gruul, or Garuk, the shaman. We have the minor talking himself. We have the immortal king. And we have, um, I think, two, um, two or three Thracian tribesmen who are found either in prisons or in situations where they might need help. But apart from that, almost every single other monster is nameless, but they're not... Uh, they're not meaningless in a sense. They're all are doing something. They're all are living in this dungeon. And um, that's something that I still find, of course, in, for example, the five e adventurous. Um, but it's not as, how, is that, how should I say, not as supported in a sense. Of course, it's still from time to time, but not the majority of times. Yeah, I think there's this tacit, agreement in, in fifth edition especially that there have to be combats like people do and I do this too like I design an adventure being like this is a combat but I when I look at an adventure like the Caverns of Thracia I have so much admiration for Janelle's I guess not only restraint but broad-minded approach to literally every encounter because every single encounter is intended to work with stealth with negotiation possibly with combat uh, any, you know, it, it embraces just wholeheartedly every possible solution every time you engage. So there, there are definitely some big, there are big named NPCs in here. And I guess there's some offshoot ones, some smaller side NPCs that sometimes have names, but not necessarily explained personalities. But just can you imagine designing an entire dungeon where there is no assumption made about how the characters are going to approach the, the engagement? It's, mm. it's, it, it's an enormous amount of work in a way to design yeah. something like that, but then you get a result like this where it's pure freedom. Of course, sometimes you still just need something to beat up, like, you know, the yes. 400 skeletons that spawn in the in the chapel of the dead of a death cult of Thanatos, which to this point, may I just, put, may I just go on a small rant here? To this, to this day, I cannot understand the stupidity of some humanoids in D&D worshipping an openly lawful evil deaf god who literally does nothing for them but like all right you worship me my boys okay i'll give you i'll give you some divine powers afterwards i just break your souls and i'll be off there's no benefit to doing this but matthew cole did actually also explain this very well in saying that yeah most of these people just want power they want power in some shape or form these beings representing like the various forces of the world they just give it to them um mm -hmm. so yeah but still, worshipping an, an evil death god, never really that good an idea, because I don't think they get dental. Yeah, like, it's a, and totally, <laughs> I don't think they provide great health insurance. Um, <laughs> it's, it's so true, because I've always wondered this, too, where, um, like, and this is a bit of a side diversion, but you look at, like, people who are trying to bring about the rise of Cthulhu again. It's like, what do you really think is going to happen if you succeed? You know, like the people worshiping Thanatos, like, what do you really think awaits you? Like, what will your prize be for your loyalty? You know, Thanatos takes the souls of the people who die in his presence and prevents them from ever being reborn, resurrected, you know, anything. So they're just gone, really gone. <laughs> I'm like, is that which what you a, want? Which in a universe like D&D, where like afterlives are a thing, Sounds kind of horrible when you think about yeah. it. Yeah. Is, this is like a cult for nihil nihilists and like, you know, the mm. stupid nihilists only. Mm -hmm. Not the free, lo free loving nihilists, just the ones that read too much Nietzsche. And yeah. <laughs> the very existentials. And they, yeah, it's so funny that I think it's true that they just, maybe they just seek worldly power because to be fair, the, the, the clerics or the spellcasters that you may encounter on, especially in the first level, they're really powerful. They're yes, actually they can very just summon strong. Skeletons, like I think, like mm -hmm. twelve skeletons is like the maximum they can summon at once. Because mm -hmm. there's a rule in once again, there's a rule in Caverns Thracia that any cleric that can summon, uh, any cleric of Thanatos can like summon at most 
cup cup of two d six skeletons, so like the random encounter number of skeletons. But still, that's a lot of skeletons. That's a lot. Spelt. That's a lot of them. <laughs> In the room full of four hundred skeletons, if that's not enough already, which. Apparently, some people have tried to fight their way through and around that room. I, I read an account of a group that that went and bought just bags full of vials of oil and then created this like fire gauntlet that they were and then because the skeletons are sort of mindless. So you pull them like you can provoke them into being pulled and then they run at you and then them just running through these curtains of fire and falling by the dozens, but I think it only killed a few hundred and there are 400 of them. So, you know, it's just, it's such a fascinating puzzle because look at the amount of creativity it demands for people who actually try to attack that room and try to yeah. do something about that room. I it's mean, just, I you, really, you really want to have a bone to pick with those skeletons if you want to fight them like <laughs> that. So, yeah. I see what you did there. <laughs> I know. Speaking of rooms, actually, Kelsey, what are some of your favorite rooms or chambers in this dungeon? Oh, I mean, I, that I one. Have a couple. That one for sure. Let me think. I, I think that I had been kind of noting down and I started to run out. I, I know this is so kind of ordinary, especially because it's on the first level, but the ravine rooms have to be some of my favorite because the, these ravines have these rope bridges built across them. And then... Um, spoiler alert, bats, giant bats that are hinted at with the guano. There are larger bats roosting in this area. And if you're using a light source to try to cross these bridges, which all player characters have to do since none of them can see, um, the bats will swoop down and attack you or try to knock you off these bridges. And it's terrifying. It's such a clever use of verticality. It's actually a, an exploration tool because it's conceivable that characters could get knocked off but fall into a river rather than plunge to their deaths on con or you know on the stone. So it's just it's I, those have to be some of my favorite because they just incorporate so many things that are beautiful about this dungeon into one. Yes, mm -hmm. I mean my personal favorite room is obviously the first room with a bat guano. I just that's like yes. wonderful setting dress. But mm -hmm. one of my favorite rooms at Mapa Dungeon is also like, you know, rather ordinary. It's like a small one. It is, I think, on the first first or second level as well. And it is specifically, um, it connotates, it, it tells you something about the death cult of Thanatos and about the society that lived in, how the cult operates. And it was about, um, you have these two chambers. In one chamber, you have a number of Thracian, ancient Thracian nobles who killed themselves but were exalted and um, chosen by Thanatos, so their souls were taken by him. And then you have the other room, and there are the servants of these people who didn't have that privilege, and they rise as undead to fight you. And that just tells you a lot, a lot about the Thracian cult without even having to tell you anything about it. It just shows you straight ahead. It just shows you how this society operated and what it meant um, to be a, a nobleman in these times. It meant that your soul was taken by Thanatos, taken into the grace of this god, and potentially you were like pulled out of a cycle of the afterlife. Maybe this was something that the Thracian people of this cult didn't like. Maybe they just thought that the afterlife or like the cycle of born, rebirth, soul going into one afterlife and then the other was just something that they were terrified by. Who knows? But it opens up so much about... Uh, to interpret about this culture in a sense. And that's just very interesting for, for me from a law perspective and how it is just built into this dungeon and into the design of the encounters again. Oh, I, that is such a good choice, Tath, because like it's also such a beautiful design way of showing the history because it, you can determine these were the like wealthy nobles that suffered this fate. And then those were obviously their servants, the lesser ones. And just the way it's set up demonstrates so much about the culture of the cult and, and the history of this place. It's just, it's like a masterclass in how to set up um, an encounter that also conveys history and like lore about the dungeon. So, I mean, it, almost every encounter has some element like that to it. Almost every room has something like that to it. There are very few empty rooms throughout the entire complex. I, I think that Janelle made a joke at the very it like towards the very end, I think in level four, there's one empty room. It might be in level three and sort of was um, kind of breaking the fourth wall a bit in the writing saying like, there's, here's the one empty room. And um, 
it, it's it's kind of fascinating how she left almost no opportunity to convey story on on the table. She she took advantage of every single room in this massive complex to do something like that. Especially room one hundred and two, which we shall never forget, is the best room in the entire game. <laughs> room one hundred and two was the the actual acknowledgement in the text. She said, "I forgot to put a one hundred and two on the map, and I don't want to like go back and redo my work. This room is mysteriously missing." <laughs> you know. <laughs> And you know what? Even a designer at her caliber is human. And, and that I appreciate too. That I appreciate yeah. too. And it goes without saying that there are a few mistakes on the map in such a vast dungeon. There, there are some yeah. people who've written articles helping correct some of the little places where like passageways misconnect. So it is true to say that this is a challenging dungeon to run. It, yeah. it requires study. And some research into how to account for some of the confusing parts that made their way into the final print of it. So um, it's not an easy one to run. Yeah, in- and mm-hmm. like with most old D and D, and actually also current D and D books, let's be honest here, the layout is fucking terrible. Like it's you have hard. okay, you have you have the beautiful compact dungeon map, which is you know it is relatively small. The dungeon itself is actually relatively small when you think about it. Um, it Single-page dungeon map every single time. And then you have walls of text beneath it. The key location, beautifully written out. Terse, but detailed, but one after the other, one after the other, the other one after the other. It feels like every single time I read a dungeon like this, um, I feel like, okay, I have to cut out the map of this and just cut up the little bits of the keys outside and just arrange them in a mind map around this dungeon because otherwise I won't be able to run it. And that is like my sole big criticism, but that's like for every D&D book that I read. Most of the time, there's like no easy way to really um, key something properly uh, and make it easy to reference back to the map. But that's just a part of it yes. being a book, so... It is true. It's it's like a problem that I still think hasn't been fully solved, um, which is funny because this being one of the first published modules, it, you know, it's grappling with those problems and trying to forge the way, you know, trying to offer some, some innovations and solutions. Like, I think that Janelle was one of the first people to just do a, like, a keying an entire dungeon starting from one and just going up until you hit 100 something. Yeah. And, um, she drew all the maps. She she drew the majority of the art in the adventure itself. And it's it's so interesting to see how the early designers were trying to grapple with these problems and where they were successful and where, you know, she this is one of the more heavily keyed early adventures, like with mo- like more description per room than was typical. Mm-hmm. And she was one of the first people to experiment with this style, which revealed some of the challenges of that style too. Like, you know, it's all a big paragraph and it's all organized in a way that probably could be improved upon nowadays with all we know about layout and bolding and whatever. But um, it's just fun to see how she, you know, wrote it in such a cool way and then discovered also the challenges of presenting it in such a way. It, yeah. It's just so cool. I don't yeah, know. And I you just it. went at it. Like there was, yes. there's not a single, like apart from that single room that is like suspiciously empty there is not a single corridor room chamber or gap in this entire dungeon that does not have some form of interaction with the dungeon itself Mm -hmm. it is incredible like you can run across traps you can run across um monsters uh, tribesmen prisoners you can run up foul of these massive statues which we'll get back to i think like in the later part of the dungeon itself which are just sometimes they act okay when there's a beast band coming across yeah they just, they just let, them, let them go let them go but when a lizard folk or when a human comes across these statues just activate and chase them down mm-hmm, mm-hmm. once again also showcases that there is some form of like you know interaction with beast folk with a dungeon that they managed to turn these ancient traps and statues to their own benefit which is also once again just storytelling lore within the dungeon it conveys Ah! stuff yes it conveys it's so wonderful it's so wonderful to have like like basically every interaction every interaction communicates some history of the dungeon like 
it's, it's, it's incredible. I know we, it, it's funny because dissecting the design of this dungeon, each thing you look at becomes more impressive where I think that it's so easy to cast aside old adventures and call them like outdated, presented poorly, not, you know, but, but the level of design and thought that went into this is monumental. And yeah. that's why it's still one of the best examples of so many of these critical elements of old school D and D. Um, so I know we've been like, the chat has been so graciously engaged <laughs> and I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want to ignore the chat. So I feel like in our, we have a few minutes cause I, I reckoned we would go about an hour. So the, the, maybe the last thing we can do tap is yes. I'm, why don't we each give like a sort of concluding statement about what we just love so much about this dungeon and then we can maybe hit some of the questions in the chat following that. So, so let's start. What do you, what do you think? Like what about this dungeon just continues to find your heart? Okay. I think the main aspect of a cavern of Frassi is just that it's a dungeon that um, you can go back into multiple times over and over again. And it, it interacts with you as much as you interact with it. There are hidden secrets in almost every single level. There are multiple encounters uh, that can be, done in every single form of uh, situation. You have the immortal Lizard King. You have the Greek Thracian vibe to it and the design elements to it. You have the monsters that utilize the items in the dungeon against you, but also maybe with you, who knows? But it's just, I've I've never run this dungeon because I said I've never played od and but it's from an academic and like design perspective, this dungeon continues to fascinate me over and over again. And I do use it for my own inspiration for my, uh, <laughs> own next soul blight things that are coming up at some point in the near future i don't know when but depths of yagi was happening you all know it <laughs> it's happening and we have seen it in the works but that it's is a terrifying. that is a beautiful i love it hey if you guys want to see okay because tap you're very generous about sharing your ideas and what you're working on next um in the the arcane library's discord server so um, that's kind of where I've been keeping track of what you're working on. So if anyone else listening in wants to know, that's probably the, one of the best places to get like little insights into what you're doing. Um, because I will so, do, do it so without anyone asking me to, because I'm just that much of an attention logger. One of my favorite things is seeing Tap be like, I have an idea and I have to write it. And then I have to put the emoji of Elmo with the fire behind him on it because it's just the right feeling. It's the right, it's the... <laughs> It's the right feeling, but oh man. Well, is I guess so. I guess to, to answer my own question I posed a minute ago, too, I think like adding on to what you said, because I agree wholeheartedly with everything, and adding on to it, I feel like the the really incredible thing about this dungeon that just keeps my fascination and my academic and design-minded love engaged at all times is that Thrasia is not a boss monster. It is not a treasure. It is not a storyline. It's not an individual. It is a place. This it's dungeon is a place. Yes. And it is meant to be about the place. There's no true goal. There's no true enemy in here. Um, and that's, what's so fascinating about it. Ultimately to me, it's got an abundance of fascinating people inside of it and treasures and monsters and stories to uncover, but it's about Thracia itself. And the way that the way that Janelle wrote it makes it a place that is so alive that it is just like a landmark in the minds of anyone who plays it, but also in D&D history. It is a landmark of location-based design, and it continues to be one of the best. Even yes. so many decades later, it continues to be one of the best, and thankfully, Goodman Games is going to finally put out a copy. Like, you know how they, they, they have the original Adventures Reincarnated line? And they're putting out a rendition of this adventure finally, given that treatment. So it will be available finally to people who are such, such fans of it. So I'm going to be first in line to buy it when it comes out, first in line. And the wonderful thing about this entire dungeon is it is incredibly unfair. It is incredibly tough. It is incredibly dangerous. And yet it's still better designed than Tomb of Horus. Oh, let's, yes. I mean, <laughs> I will die on that hill. I will die on that hill. There are some people who love Tomb of Horrors and good, good. No. Uh but this Thracia to me, like if someone was like, which adventure would you choose if all other adventures had to be blown up? I would choose Thracia. So um, that's that's it. I wonder, okay, Tap, is there anything crazy in the chat that we should answer? I want to scroll through for any things ending in a question mark quickly. Someone asked, what's the recommended party level? Um, it's recommended to, I mean, it's a beginner level. It starts at first level, I think. Um, and... Um, 
it's not really specifically for any level because the challenges are so varied that it's more about how smart can you play, not how powerful are you. Yeah. So, yeah. It is definitely a dungeon designed to make use of the adventuring gear list. Not just like I told Kelsey like earlier, you're meant to, to worship the adventure gear list in the original player's handbook, like a golden god, like the Frassians built worship Thanatos. That's exactly how you should go about it. Use whatever tools you have because you're going to need them. Yes. You're going to need them. You can't survive on spells alone. No, bring ropes, torches, you know, bribes, um, anything, bring it all with you and you will use them. So I guess that's, well, I think that's a, that's a really nice bow on our conversation. We literally gushed for an hour about how much we freaking love this dungeon. And I think if you're not persuaded to check it out, nothing can persuade you. You, you should, I mean, especially when it's actually available, like you could get probably copies on eBay or whatever, but um when Goodman Games pushes a launch button on getting a legit copy of this, like you have to, you have to. It's one of the most fascinating things to study from a design perspective and run it if, you know, someday tap. I hope we, maybe we should try to fire up some, some Thrasia sessions in the server because it's so worthy yeah. of being explored. Maybe yeah, we, we should try that at some point. But the beautiful thing, thing is after all, after an hour long runs, we haven't even really covered like 10% of this entire thing. It's that bloody huge just by being so small. So yeah, yes. you'll be surprised no matter how, how much you read up about it. Playing this will be a treat. It will be a horrible, horrible treat of ancient myth and minotaurs and minotaur lizards. I still can't wrap my head around it. Um, <laughs> just pay homage to the immortal king and you probably will be fine. Probably. I don't know. I don't speak for him. <laughs> <I> just, <laughs> But you do represent him quite well in description. So if anyone were to run him as the game master, it should be you, Taz. So maybe we'll Thank get that you. opportunity. I will try my best. <laughs> <laughs> Most excellent. Okay. Well, you all, I, I, I think, thank you so much for tuning in to our discussion. This is like stuff that comes from the heart. This was an impromptu thing we decided to do just out of pure love for this dungeon. And if you've made it all the way through and you could listen to our craziness, thank you for indulging us because we just love to talk about this kind of thing. So we should do this more often, actually. Now, but I think we about should, it. we, we should. should, we will. And um, d please check out Tass work on drive through RPG soul blight. It is magnificent. You, you cannot read it and not walk away inspired. It is also the first setting ever released for shadow dark RPG, which is, I am honored to, to that you did that for the game, and I it's, think it's just I was inspired in the midst of night, and it took me by force, and now I can't ever get it out of my head ever again. It's, it is a blight upon my brain, and I will release it upon the world. Good. There's more coming, thank goodness, because we all want more, so. Awesome. More coming next year. Yes, yes, indeed. You can find me on Drive Through RPG. You can also find me on Twitter, as long as that ship is still sailing under that occult DM. I don't do it much there. I just promote my stuff. And sometimes I annoy Kelsey and my friends. That's it. You won't get anything else. We love it. We love it. The, but I'm very active in the wonderful uh, Shadow Dark, no, not Shadow Dark, Arcane Library Discord, which Kelsey has, in which there are many other talented minds waiting for you specifically. Or maybe Join maybe us. Maybe we even worship at my altar. I don't even know. Kelsey, have you built up an altar for me yet in the Discord? There's definitely a, a like a virtual altar now. I think everybody knows that when they see Kanupra mentioned that we all have to hail. It's it's just required. Um it is. the gods of the gods of Soul Blight and the gods of the generic Shadow Dark setting are truly alive in our Discord server. Um and we love talking there. The server is now like technically an open server. You don't have to get us an invite anymore. You can get yourself in if you want to. But if you want to get in, just message me. We develop our material in there. And we we honestly just goof off and have fun doing what we love in there. So. Is there a link in the description, Kelsey, of this I'll put video? One. I will put one. Excellent. And if you decide to join our server, please be a nice person. It's one of the only corners of the internet that is still a kind, loving, and cool place. I can genuinely say that. So um, yes. we would be happy to have you if you want to join some community like that and play some games with us. I'm inspired. I think, well, I'll have to try to run some Thracia sessions in honor of this discussion coming up in the future. So we'll, we'll sort that out. 
So indeed. Yes. All right. All right. But I do believe that was everything for today. Join us again next time. I don't know when when we'll do this again, but I'm always up for it because I do enjoy discussing this sort of stuff with you, Kelsey. It's very fun. Same. We will we will be inspired to do this again, and it's going to happen. So when it does, we'll announce it, and we'll do some more discussions. So, all right, you all. Well, we might hey, just pick apart. No, we might just pick apart like one of the modern five E dungeons. Say, tell us, tell why we don't like them or why we do like them. I don't know. <laughs> exactly. Maybe we need to be mean in our next one because we were so like reverent in this one. Maybe we need to be like, and now it's time to criticize. But it, um, it is time we'll to become the mean neckbeard we were always meant to be. Yeah, should we get fake beards and wear them when we know? We just have our hair, we just style of Marcus. Tie it with a knot right here. Yes, yes, indeed. We'll find some. In my time, everything was better. Everyone walked uphill both ways to the dungeon. Yes, and we liked it. We used encumbrance with copper coins, and we liked it. We calculated the weights every time. Oh God, we're gonna we're gonna go down a rabbit hole. Okay, we yes. we love the dungeons from that era, and we are weirdos who will always delight in talking about this. And so, thank you for joining us in our discussion. And we'll catch you for the next one, everybody. Have a good Wednesday, and good wherever you are in the world, you. thank you so much. <laughs> all right, you all. Bye. All hail Kanupra! All hail. <laughs> I think we I think